All right, here we go. We are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie B, and I am going to be uh, giving a presentation here for session six of our Defending Genesis 2022 conference. So uh, I'm excited for this, uh, guys. The evolutionary community, they're going to be having quite a few evolutionist tears after this one. As a matter of fact, after the entire conference in general, we've already got uh, 12 plus hours in the books for the Defending Genesis 2022 conference. And we've already touched on so many important topics. Genesis genetics with Matt. We just finished a show on dinosaurs in the Bible and the G illogic column. Um, we've had a ton of fun so far. And, you know, the best way to prepare for one of these presentations, nice, fresh cup of evolutionist tears. So shout out to everybody in the chat. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, yes, Doki Doki Bible Club. You are absolutely right, brother. The final nail in the coffin of evolutionism. That's right. You know, it's 2022, and it is an amazing time to be a young earth creationist, to be a biblical creationist. It's why we do what we do, and admittedly, maybe we have too much fun doing what we uh, what we do, because um, at the end of the day, the evolutionist, the evolutionary community makes it far too easy for us. So today's, uh, this specific session is titled, The Best Evidence for Evolution Debunked. And um, this is going to feature kind of a snapshot of what is going to be found here in the updated and expanded special creation book. Okay, dismantling evolution and confirming independent origin. So this should be available in the next 24 hours, 270 pages, the most up-to-date book you are going to find on the topic of separate ancestry, um, gets into human evolution, Neanderthals, mitochondria leave, why chromosome Noah, chromosome two fusion, junk DNA, endogenous retroviruses. That being said, if you want a full 200 page beatdown of end endogenous retroviruses, do please uh, check out the endogenous retrovirus handbook. Um, so, okay, you know what? Let's just get right into it. I am going to share screen and I will periodically check from my phone, make sure the um, make sure the audio, video, slides, all the good stuff are coming in uh, good, well, and strong. So let me pull up the show from here. And looks good for my end. So, Good to see everybody. This has been a ton of fun. Time flies by. The summer flew by because I was setting this conference up months ago. And I knew I wanted roughly, you know, 10, 11 speakers. We got about, uh, about that, 10 or 11. Uh, we're going to wrap it up with a debate that I'm looking forward to on Friday. It's going to be an awesome debate. And... Um, yeah, time's flown by because we set it up, you know, two to three months ago, and here we are, and we are already in uh, day three. So if you're just joining us and you're new to this channel or conference, uh, here it is, Defending Genesis 2022, hosted by Standing for Truth Ministries. We've done several conferences um, at this point. Our last conference we did was with the creation research team, who we just had on today for session four or five, um, that was on flood boundaries. So a controversial topic in the young earth creation world. And I believe John and Joe gave a, uh, an irrefutable presentation uh, for that conference. So uh, this conference, 2022, uh, Sal Giardina, professional geologist, he uh, kickstarted the week with us um, on, and again, I'll be looking at the chat periodically, guys, just uh, so you guys let me know how everything's going. Um, so Sal Giardina, The Relevance of Genesis, comprehensive, very informative uh, presentation. 
we had a good discussion on evidence for the flood, going over many of the uh, common objections advanced by the evolutionists. Then we had T Rock, who's done a ton of study on dating methods, including isochron dating. And so um, that's a must watch. It was technical. Uh, it's an important program. There's not much out there on isochron dating, at least in the world of YouTube. And so we really wanted to put that one to bed. And, uh, and we did. T Rock put a lot of work, research, and study in, into this presentation. Highly recommended. The isochron method and other dating duds, because that's what it is, duds. And the evolutionist model is a big dud as well. Um, some would say, you know, evolutionary theory is not in crisis. I'm here to tell you it is in crisis. I mean, it's it's done. It, it's a big dud. So um, then we had day two, Genesis Genetics. Um, Goku in the house. Good to see you. Hope you uh, brought your buddy Vegeta for this presentation in case he's an evolutionist. So uh, Genesis Genetics by Matt N. That was yesterday, three to three and a half hours. That was that was an entire conference in and of itself. <laughs> that one session was could have been its own conference. Uh, Matt put a ton of work into that. I, that was great. Definitely got to share that. Around. I'm going to try and get this whole conference up on the website, uh, obviously, when it's done. And... Um, what I'd really like to do, if anyone's out there that can help share this around, spread the word, I'd love to uh, learn how to or have someone do it for us. And of course, we work together on it. Uh, turn this conference into a DVD uh, series, like a, a DVD collector's uh, edition, uh, where we have the entire uh, conference in DVD format. It could be like a collector's edition where you have you know, a few different discs, five discs, one for each day of the conference. Uh, but my email is posted on the website. So anybody that has any expertise in that, please do uh, reach out. We're always looking for help um, as we are doing this uh, full time. We try to be jack of all trades, but, you know, sometimes there's there's certain things we would love to get some help on. So, um, OK, th then we had a uh, countering compromise. Another three hours. Uh, this one was with CJ Cox, um, you know, arguments from people like John Walton, Michael Heiser, uh, Hugh Ross and the uninspiring compromiser were absolutely decimated during this show. So that was a ton of fun. Today, I was really looking forward to this one. Comprehensive, technical, a must watch. And it's funny, all of the uh, all of your fans, all of your geologic column cheerleaders, OK, that bow down to the so-called geologic column. They weren't here to present their challenges or objections. Because I'm here to tell you, the geologic column is the geologic column. And two and a half hours was uh, session five here, just ended a couple hours ago. John Mackay, Joseph Hubbard, um, two amazing flood researchers, well-educated, well-qualified. Um, two of my favorite young earth creations. I mean, these brothers are warriors. Uh, this was just two and a half hours of just nonstop information. Just an irrefutable show. Uh, this show alone should be enough to uh, convert the skeptic. Um, and so just looking at the chat. Good to see everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nunya Biz always cracking me up. Laughter's the best medicine, brother. So we had dinosaurs in the Bible and the G illogic column. Now we've got evolutionist favorite arguments debunked. I'll give about an hour presentation. I mean, I've got over a thousand slides. I'll get through what I think is important. You know, I'll make sure to debunk the favorite talking points, homology, nested hierarchies, transitional forms, chromosome two fusion, endogenous retroviruses, pseudogenes, um, you know, ALU sequences, genetic diversity in Africa and Neanderthal phylogenetics. I'll make sure to get through all of these, wrap it up at about maybe an hour to an hour and a half presentation. Um, whoever's still around at that point, you can uh, shoot me, rapid fire me a few questions, and then, and then we're going to call it. Because tomorrow we've got another big day. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Jerry Bergman. He'll be session seven. Darwin's frauds, blunders, and forgeries. I'm excited for this. Uh, he's been here three times before. And always a good time with Dr. Bergman. So, um, yeah, make sure you're here for that. We're going to have a uh, conversation after his present presentation, followed by a QA and a from you guys. Then we're going to have our very own Professor David McQueen and George Bond. 
our team, uh, you know, flood researchers, uh, they're going to be here for an amazing presentation on the worldwide flood. Then day uh, Friday's day five, our final day, wrapping things up. This is going to be about a 25 hour conference. Okay. So again, comprehensive, lots of audience and skeptic interaction. We're going to have Matt Powell here. Uh, my brother, Matt will be here. Evidence for creation. And then uh, we're wrapping it all up with an epic debate, the ev uh, evolution debate challenge, Dr. Dino, uh, you know, one of the world's greatest debaters out there. He just had his 300th debate. Uh, very impressive. Uh, you know, Kent's going to be uh, debating David Emery. David's always uh, civil, respectful in these debates. He's the perfect interlocutor for Dr. Dino to wrap up this, uh, this awesome conference that I hope everybody is enjoying as much as, uh, as much as myself. So uh, David Emery, Dr. Dino, rematch the Evolution Debate Challenge. And um, last month, somewhat connected to this conference, <clears throat> we had uh, Michael J. Ord, uh, Ocean Sediments and Incredible New Flood Developments. So please do check that one out if you have not yet seen it. Um, and we're just going to get right into it now. So we got that out of the way. Um, if you haven't yet watched or, or are up to date on the uh, seminars, the sessions so far, uh, definitely make sure to check them out tonight. Okay, so it looks like um, <laughs> Menya Biz. I don't know if you can see me. There you go. Evolutionist Tears. This is what keeps me going strong. This is how I can do. Uh, you know, 12 hours of uh, conference content in a couple days. Uh, better than any uh, cup of coffee. <laughs> so the best evidence for evolution, debunked, dismantled, decimated, you know, whatever word you want to use to describe it. Um, but the, the question is going to be, what do we mean by evolution, right? Evidence for evolution, question mark. Well, it depends what you mean by evolution. And proponents, guardians, defenders of evolution, the defenders of evolution, that's going to be uh, their villain title, um, will be the uh, guardians of, of creation. So uh, proponents of evolution are guilty of assuming change over time means large scale evolution is true. Okay, guys, change over time is not disputed. We know that all kinds of things change over time, right? Cars can change over time. Our cell phones change over time. The way we think about certain things changes over time. So if by evolution, the evolutionist means change over time, or the biological definition of evolution simply means changes in allele frequencies in populations over time or over generations, then there's nothing to argue over. That is not disputed. Change over time is not disputed, okay? We, as biblical creationists, we expect change. But the question is, what type of change is being observed? Is it the type that's consistent with the biblical model of ancestry? Or is it the type of change that is uh, consistent and necessary for pond scum to people evolution, to take your fish to fishermen? Okay, and um, basically the changes we see in terms of allele frequencies, okay, allele frequency changes, it does not equal or equate to evolution, especially the type of evolution that you can see here on the evolutionary tree of life, which it's funny, I've had, you know, nearly a hundred debates on um, all sorts of topics, but most debates on evolutionary theory, ancestry, and many evolutionists, uh, more so the uninformed ones, they will at first argue that no, you know, they're not related to mushrooms. They're not related to banana plants. They're not related to whales or green algae or bacteria because it sounds silly because it is silly. But universal common ancestry would say that life is universally, believe it or not, universally related. While the biblical creationists would hold to what's called separate ancestry. Okay, which would argue that bacteria and humans or bacteria and whales are not related. But evolutionists would say bacteria and whales are related through common ancestry. So you have a lot of evolutionists. They waste time saying, no, we don't believe that. We don't believe banana plants and whales are related. You know, that's a straw man. And then you show them 
their universal phylogenetic tree of life. And uh, eventually it's like a light bulb going off and they realize, yes, I do believe that I am related to a banana plant. Okay. I do believe the evolutionist that is not me, that whales and pine trees are related. And that's basically what universal common ancestry would teach. Okay. As you can see here, you've got that single celled uh, like ancestor at the uh, bottom of the tree where you have, uh, you know, the origin of life, abiogenesis, but from these lifeless, lifeless chemicals, you, uh, you basically get your first single celled like ancestor, which evolves into a multi-celled ancestor, which evolves into a fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, monkey, man. Okay. Up the tree of life. That's why you see man at the top with, um, you know, rhinos, elephants over here, jellyfish, octopus, so everything's related according to the um, universal common ancestry model. So for large scale evolution to be true, you basically need in terms of the genomic changes that are observed, you need those changes to be vertical. But unfortunately, what we see in the genome equates to horizontal changes. What I mean by that is modifications of pre-existing systems and genetic variation is not evidence that single celled like ancestors evolved into whales and humans over long periods of time. That's not what we see. And that's not consistent with the data. Okay. The types of alterations needed to explain large scale evolution need to be vertical changes that can create true novelties, expand genetic information, increase phenotypic complexity. Again, the observed changes are consistent with the pre-existing capacity for change. And that's what we're gonna get into in a little bit, the, de uh, the design diversity model. As you can see here, evolutionists imagine that time can solve all of their problems, right? Um, over time, a single cell like ancestor can evolve into a whale. Well, here's the thing. If I told you that Superman could fly quickly through the air, you'd say that's silly, that's myth. That doesn't fit reality. But if I told you Superman could fly slowly through the air, you'd say that's that's more believable. The evolutionists would say that, uh, basically, because time is the hero of the plot for the evolutionists. But more time actually equals more deleterious mutation accumulation, okay? Because the mechanisms for evolutionary transformation to take a single cell like ancestor into, into a whale over lots of time mutations, selection, epigenetics, to add the necessary genetic uh, material for natural selection to act upon, that's mutations. Mutations to the evolutionary model is the source for all genetic variation. But the problem is most of these mutations turn out to be deleterious, damaging, disease causing, and also rather than being absolutely neutral, they are effectively neutral or nearly neutral. That means natural selection being a limited force, being a, a um, stability inducing force. It keeps a species as strong as it can be, but it's not adding anything, anything new. And selection can't see most mutations. Selection can't see the effectively neutral mutations that are building up over time, leading uh, systems and organisms into genetic sickness. Mutations degrade genetic functionality and information content. Since selection can't see these mutations, they're subject to genetic drift. They spread through populations over time. This means that time, although the evolutionist wants time to be the hero of the plot, is actually the enemy. Because the more time you get, the more extinction and degeneration you get. So no, Superman flying quickly through the air or slowly through the air is still a fairy tale. A single celled like ancestor evolving into a whale quickly, that's a fairy tale. A single celled like ancestor evolving into a whale slowly, it's still a fairy tale. It's pseudoscience. And you can have trillions of years, and all you're going to get is more extinction, more disease, more degeneration. That is basic. That's what we know about mutations. If you can't show me how it happened, universal common ancestry, common descent. Don't tell me that it did happen because you don't have a mechanism because your proposed mechanisms, evolutionists, degrade functionality. Your so-called best beneficial mutations turn out to be reductive, turn out to be functionally compromising to organisms. All right. If I told you Mary Poppins could fly quickly through the air with her umbrella, you'd admit that that's a fairy tale. 
But if I told you Mary Poppins could fly slowly through the air with her umbrella, you'd say, no, that's not a fairy tale. Evolution is about the slow accumulation of uh, mutations leading to genetic variation that selection can act upon. That's what's going to take your single celled like ancestor into a whale. No. Again, slowly, quickly, it's a fairy tale. It doesn't happen. Grandpa, <laughs> I'm here to tell you that no, contrary to what the pseudoscientific pushing um, evolutionists want to say, this is not your grandpa, and that's what this presentation is going to uh, prove. Uh, evolutionists hope, dream, and imagine that whales and pine trees are, are related. So again, um, whether you have trillions of years or thousands of years, evolution is not going to happen. Okay. So I want to go through a couple slides here, just showing the uh, amazing variety uh, in God's designed world. Okay. Because in the biblical model, remember, we're looking at the changes. The changes that we see, are they consistent with the evolutionary model or are they consistent with um, the, the evolutionary model or, or the biblical model? Just looking at the chat, looks like everything's good. Okay, I appreciate it. So in the biblical creation model, we have God front-loading creatures with what? Well, with the ability to change and adapt to new environments. Guys, if God did not front-load creatures with the ability to vary and to adapt to their environment, species would have gone extinct by now. Ever-changing environments require what? Well, they require ever-changing genomes. Adaptation, which is what we see with these changes, but the evolutionist wants to erroneously <laughs> equate adaptation with you know, the evolution of higher life forms, the evolution of novel body plans. No, I'm sorry, we have something called the Cambrian explosion. We have all of these phyla suddenly appearing. Okay, this explosion of new body plans and novel organisms. Assuming the evolutionary model for a second, the space of time we have available for the evolution of this massive amount of variation and complexity is tiny. To take a land mammal into a whale over time, according to the evolutionary model, took about 10 million years while getting jellyfish and coral and trilobites and all of this phyla, all of these massively different organism, phylum level differences occurred in a moment, an explosion. And it's not just the Cambrian explosion. We, we see explosions all throughout the fossil record. The fossil record is not evidence for evolution. The fossil record, what we see is stasis, sudden appearance, the explosion of, of novel body plans. Okay, consistent with creation. And again, the best way to, to determine ancestry anyways is through genetics. It's genes, traits, and genetics that are inherited sperm and egg. Not a rock, not geography, not a bone. And that is why looking at a bone without the genetics, without breeding tests, it's going to be incredibly difficult to determine what is the result of homology or what is the result of convergent evolution. That is because today we understand that there oftentimes exists more variation within the same species than across species. If every single dog breed today, what is there, about 400 of them, were to drown in a flood, and thousands of years later, the, the bones of these dogs from your Great Dane to your Husky to your Chihuahua were dug up, you get all kinds of erroneous conclusions. This evolved into this. This isn't even related to this, even though they all belong to. Uh, the domestic dog category. And that's what we see in the fossil record is uh, they've accidentally taken uh, different bones of, I believe it was a, a, a variation of Tyrannosaurus rex. And it was actually the same species, the same creature, but in different stages of its life. Okay. And, you know, adulthood, a, a younger um, dinosaur. And they erroneously concluded that these are multiple species. But then they determined, because remember the fossil records, low quality, low confidence science, they ended up realizing, oops, this is the same species. This is the same creature just in different stages of its life. But they said it's different species. This is how weak the fossil record is, okay? And they have no good answer for the Cambrian explosion. Um, a phylum level event like we see in the Cambrian explosion would require an astronomical number of evolutionary experiments and misfits. 
Okay, and yet we have no evidence for these novel body plans and creatures popping up in the Cambrian explosion. Again, the fossil record shows a stasis and sudden appearance and not large-scale evolution. It is going to be in the world of genetics that we can best answer this question of ancestry. And so with the fossil record out of the way, that's what I mainly want to uh, <laughs> uh, focus on. Uh, very true. Doki. Okay, so right here we see a uh, we see a great variety. Okay, we see a great variety of, for example, equids, because again, in the biblical creation model, we have God um, creating the original created archetypes with huge levels of what's called heterozygosity, a state of DNA diversity. This way, species can adapt to their environment. Because again, if they did not have pre-existing genetic diversity, the ability to change and vary, they'd go extinct rapidly. And so adaptation is actually evidence of God's brilliance and ability to think ahead. If you want evidence for God, look for evidence of forward thinking and look for evidence of forward thinking in the genome. Okay, this is what we see especially with the so-called junk DNA areas of our genome, we understand that what used to be some of their best arguments like pseudogenes, which they used to say, well, we've got these pseudogenes, these shared genetic mistakes between humans and chimpanzees, and therefore we must have inherited them from a common ancestor roughly six to 10 million years ago. And so those shared pseudogenes are evidence of, of that relationship because they've been passed down. But it turns out that pseudogenes represent functional DNA units. OK, functional DNA elements necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. We see the same thing with endogenous retroviruses, ALU sequences, all types of non-coding um, RNA genes. This all screams of forward thinking because a lot of these DNA elements are only called upon and manifested under certain uh, situations, certain environmental conditions. OK, why that's important is it's very similar to. Uh, let's say the uh, spare tire in the back of your car, right? At first glance, the evolutionists would say, well, wh why do you got an extra tire? You know, what's the, you've already got your four tires. They're working. Your car's working fine. You know, that's redundant. It's junk evolutionary leftover. But no, if you enter an environment where you get a flat tire, then guess what? Thank God you have that spare tire that was put there by human engineers due to forward thinking. And that's what we have in the, the genomes of living organisms is evidence for forward thinking that points us back to the forward thinker, okay? All of this change we see, design diversity, it's based on pre-programmed genetic algorithms. So yes, change is true. Here we go. A, a variety of cats, a variety of dogs, a variety of, you know, it's funny because the evolutionists want to, you know, point to a variety of, of equids or horses, variety of cats, variety of roses, apples, strawberries, and conclude because of the incredible variation that we see that arose simply because of the pre-existing capacity to vary. That means in their mind, right, Darwin saw a variety of finches. And he concluded that finches and banana plants are related through common ancestry. No, Darwin, that proves that we have a variety of finches. Finches can change. Cats can change. Dogs can change. It doesn't demonstrate that dogs, cats, finches, and strawberries are related through common ancestry. No, that's not science. That's not observed. It's not even possible since the mechanisms of, of change that the evolutionists look to actually degrade genetic functionality. You are not going to get the expansion of genetic information through degrading mutations, mutations that result in disease. a single point mutation can kill an organism. But unfortunately for the evolutionists, most mutations are deleterious. They are effectively neutral. Selection can't see them. And so they build up over time. So yes, change is true. Adaptation is true. There's no problem with organisms changing. And claiming that evolution is simply change over time is no help to the evolutionist that wants to argue change over time means whales and strawberries are related through common ancestry. Again, the ability to adapt is exactly why we have so many variations in different kinds of creatures, but yet each creature stays its own kind. Okay, for example, we have cats here. Okay, and from your arc archetype, right, you have, let's say, two heterozygous cats on board the arc who are 
front loaded with genetic diversity and pre-existing DNA differences from those pre-existing DNA differences you get through environmental uh, triggers and stressors, you get all your different cat variations from your house cat to your tiger, to your lion and everything else, your jaguar, all based on the pre-existing ability to adapt and change in the first place. Um, so I'm going to keep going with slides here, but I'm thinking if I go full screen, it might be easier to see uh, the details of, of the pictures. Let me know in the chat if that, if that helps a little bit better. Um, so again, a variety of all, all types of creatures and the type of change that we see that leads to this type of variation, it's due to the pre-existing capacity for this. So that's not going to help take your fish to fishermen. So yes, the arc archetypes, they varied since the flood, but they have not experienced any real forward evolution. As a matter of fact, this change has limits. And this is what I want to get into next because the evolutionists are constantly asking the question, well, what, um, okay, just looking at the chat. All right, so it looks good. We'll keep it this way. Thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate that. So we'll keep it this way, um, especially if some of the pictures are small. Okay, so uh, the evolution is constantly asking, you know, what is the limits to the change then, right? If, if you're never going to get new kinds, brand new kinds from previous kinds, then where's the limit? You must draw a line. Well, based on the created heterozygosity model, we're going to have what's called shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity. Because if you think about it, at creation, you have the most heterozygous ancestors, okay? And from these heterozygous ancestors, which again just means a state of DNA diversity, millions of DNA differences in chromosome pairs, okay? And um, new visible traits, new chromosomal combinations can arise based on this pre-existing genetic diversity. This makes sense because when God said to be fruitful and multiply, did he want this to be carried out through cloning? Of course not. Of course not. So if Adam and Eve and the created kinds were created genetically homozygous, that's what they would basically uh, produce is clones. No, God said to be uh, fruitful and multiply. And so it only makes sense that God would have front loaded Adam and Eve and the created kinds with pre-existing functional heterozygosity. But this change based on the starting point of design diversity, it is going to have limits, all right? Creatures adapt and vary based on the available allelic variability, but species hit walls over time. And this is because you can only have so many shifts in heterozygosity, again, a greater level of diversity, to homozygosity, less genetic diversity and allelic variability. Think of a, think of a wolf to a dog. I think generally most creationists would admit or agree that your domestic dogs and you know wolves, Canis lupus, go back to a common ancestor because from heterozygous wolf archetypes off of the ark, you can get your wolves, your coyotes, your dingoes, and your domestic dogs. But going from a wolf to a chihuahua is ultimately a reduction in allelic variability. Okay, variations hit walls, and a chihuahua is a wall. There's not much you can now do in terms of variation, available variation with a chihuahua. You're never going to be able to take two chihuahuas and artificially select for a, a wolf over time. So yes, according to the biblical creation model, speciation is expected to slow down over time since the available heterozygosity decreases over time. We as biblical creationists, we look back to the creation event and we see an expansion of allelic variability. Notice here, scenario one, DNA copies are different, which can lead to variation. That is a heterozygous state versus scenario two, DNA copies are the same, a homozygous state where you're going to get no variation, a state of no DNA diversity, basically. Okay. So um, right here, be fruitful and multiply, make sense of um, of his command here. Nuclear DNA, you know, your autosomal DNA, where we have recombination, as you can see here from, from the picture, would be inherited uh, from, from all ancestors. It's biparentally inherited DNA. Your uniparentally inherited DNA, we're going to touch on later, your mitochondrial DNA and your Y chromosome. So right here, uh, genetic limits. Furthermore, this front loading of genetic information at the creation event also naturally sets limits on the speciation process. Since most of the genetic variety we see today goes back to the creation week, 
formation of new kinds, right? Higher categorization, such as at the family level, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, we're gonna get into class, uh, classification soon. Would require a massive miraculous input of new genetic information. Because again, you can only have so many shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity before you hit a wall. Under the parameters we just laid out, evolution as Darwin described is not possible. Again, it's the evolutionists that explain the vast majority of genetic variations being the result of what? Mutations over time. While the creationist explains the vast majority of DNA diversity as being the result of created nuclear heterozygosity. That means the beneficial diversity for the most part is due to initial design. But the negative diversity that we see over time that accumulates that is due to mutations because mutations degrade, mutations lead to disease, mutations are functionally compromising to organisms. Notice this, it represents a scientifically superior explanation to any that Darwin or his scientific descendants have proposed to date. Exactly. This model, and this is where I want to move on to uh, testable predictions. This model leads to testable and falsifiable predictions which again is the gold standard of science, okay? And it's creations based on this starting point of design diversity that are making testable predictions on DNA function. And the trajectory of discovery when it comes to DNA function actually favors genome-wide functionality, all right? We understand that most of our genome has tremendous evidence for, for biochemical activity and biochemical function. I've touched quite a bit on this in my books, previous lectures and debates. This is important because if design diversity is true, then an obvious prediction would be that the vast majority of DNA elements, DNA sequences is functional and beneficial. And that's exactly what we see with the best so-called lines of evidence for evolution. Endogenous retroviruses represent highly functional DNA units. ALU sequences represent highly functional DNA units. Functional Okay, when it comes to ERVs, functional in embryological development, functional in determining cell types, functional in gene expression, they act as antiviral protectors, they act in tumor suppression, that's just to name a few. And the evolutionists are incapable of showing any non-functional endogenous retroviruses going from non-functional or even altering their pre-existing function, okay, to something that is literally needed in the organism to survive. Because I have papers demonstrating that even the secular scientists admit without endogenous retrovirus elements, we couldn't exist. I like to exist. The evolutionist likes to exist. Everybody in the chat hopefully likes to exist. Without ERVs, we literally wouldn't exist. And this is all part of the design diversity prediction. Pseudogenes, same thing. They represent functional units of of DNA. So again, uh, it was in uh, 2012, as a matter of fact, that the ENCODE project came out with remarkable findings indicating that upwards of 80% of the human genome was active to some extent. Okay, this is biochemical function. And it was surprising to discover that the genome consists of only about 20,000 genes. This was not an expected a, uh, a, or anticipated number. We now know that the vast uh, portion of the human genome consists of non-coding DNA sequences, sequences that uh, don't directly code for protein products. This is a major reason why so many in the evolutionary community assume that most of the human genome constituted what? Useless evolutionary baggage. Remember, if what we see is a result of millions of years of descent with modification, then the genomes of living organisms should reflect that. And so a direct expectation from the evolutionary model, this model right here, fish to fisherman evolution, would be lots of evolutionary leftovers, genomic fossils, viral fossils, be it that's not what we find. We find the opposite. We find genomes of treasure rather than genomes of junk. And this is why your militant evolutionists fight the evidence so strongly in favor of genome-wide functional uh, functionality. Because again, even when it comes to mutation accumulation, guys, okay, they've done uh, numerical simulations where even if the genome was only 10% functional, degeneration would be inevitable. 
organisms would descend into, gen into genetic sickness. But we now understand that the genome is somewhere between, between 60 and 80% functional. That means evolution's falsified. It can't happen. That's roughly 60 to 80 deleterious mutations accumulating from generation to generation. So again, you can have trillions of years. Time is not the hero of the story for the evolutionists. The more years you have, the more extinction and degeneration you get. These mutations that accumulate in humans, roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation, with most of those being deleterious, since most of the genome is functional as predicted by the design diversity or created heterozygosity hypothesis. So again, the evolutionists require genomes of junk in order that the genomes of living organisms can reflect descent with modification. So I hope that makes sense to the audience. All right. And what they've actually advanced in the form of an argument or rebuttal to this amazing evidence for genome-wide activity is that this activity is not actually useless. The transcription is simply spurious or it's just noise. Okay, it's not important. <laughs> but the question is, if this is not real beneficial activity, then why is the cell bothering with it? Why is the cell bothering transcribing it? This would be incredibly wasteful of resources and energy for the cell. Okay, this activity is strong indication that it is uh, useful and beneficial. So this whole argument that suggests most of the transcription uh, taking place in the genome is, is merely spurious and just genetic noise, it doesn't make very much sense. Since we recognize that transcribing a portion of the genome is a what? It's a very energy intensive process. Guys, every time a nucleotide is being added to a growing RNA chain, you are consuming a great deal of energy. These transcripts would clutter up the interior of the cell if they weren't playing any real operational uh, role. So right off the bat, intuitively, this evolutionary rescue device does not make a lot of sense. In addition to this already serious blow to this evolutionary rescue device, there should also be mechanisms that can suppress transcription if the pervasive genome-wide activity really was just noise. It's not noise. And if they think it's noise, then go on paper, go on record and make some testable predictions and say, I predict that the vast majority of the genome is non-functional junk. And as a matter of fact, I volunteer to have the majority of my genome knocked out <laughs> through genetic knockout experiments. Then we'll see how you feel after 90% of your genetic uh, sequences and DNA units are knocked out or snipped out or turned off. I want to see how many evolutionists are going to volunteer for that. Because creationists, on the other hand, we're making very specific predictions that the vast majority of the genome and DNA elements are functional and beneficial to living organisms. And so if we were to knock out specific genes. And, you know, fortunately in humans, it's, it's unethical to do so, but we can make and have made very specific predictions on, on what may be the result. Okay. You alter a certain, uh, you know, genetic sequence and it results in a disease. And the reason why it's resulting in a disease is because guess what? You are messing with a functional DNA unit. And by messing with it, it's resulting in, in disease. All right. So again, um, these rescue devices do not work. And I find it funny, and this is what brings me to the slide here, okay? They want to say, as I've shown throughout this presentation, universal common ancestry, they want to say that um, uh, they want to say that whales and pine trees and strawberries are related, right? And this is all this has all occurred due to a long process of mutations and natural selection and time, right? Dead nothing into alive everything. Pond scum into people, fish into fishermen, your single celled like ancestor into a multi celled ancestor into a fish, into an amphibian, into a reptile, into a monkey, into a man. Okay, these evolutionary mechanisms that have no mind, but yet what we understand about the epigenome and the forward thinking mechanisms that genomes are comprised of, they're giving selection and mutations of mind without even admitting it or knowing it half the time. So apparently these mechanisms can take your pond scum to people, but these mechanisms are incapable of removing all of this junk. 
well, you know, your PhDs, like your Dr. Dan Stern, Cardinals of the world, they'll just say, well, it's easier for the genome to just keep it around, just transcribe it at low levels. It's easier than removing it. Yeah, because guess what? It's there and they're not going to tap out. So they got to put forth some kind of rescue device, but it doesn't work. It's contradictory. It's pseudoscience. It's a fairy tale to say that these mechanisms are going to take a fish to fishermen, but they're not going to be capable of, of removing, you know, 80% junk <clears throat> from the genome. So, um, you know, that, that, that's a lot there uh, for the first portion of this, but it is important to touch on this simply because the uh, genetic data really is the best way to determine ancestry. And in the world and realm of genetics, evolutionists are losing, they're just losing horribly. <sighs> okay, so let's get into uh, classification because evolutionists, unfortunately, have wasted a lot of time, energy, and money on classifying the biological world. And that's where you get, again, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And, um, you know, we classify and organize things all the time. You know, I, I organize my books upstairs according to their respective categories. I've got my evolution books here, my creation books here, uh, you know, various other kinds of apologetics books over here, theology books there, soteriology books, you know, over here in this place. This doesn't prove that since all the books, you know, use the same 26 letters of the alphabet and all have a certain percentage of similarity in terms of the words used, the topics discussed, and so on, it doesn't prove any kind of relationship. Okay, we classify modes of transportation. You know, these are sedans, these are hatchbacks, these are SUVs. You know, put the SUVs over here, put the vans over here, put your uh, crossover vehicles over here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't prove anything that we can classify things. We classify all types of things, and it turns out that you know we spend a lot of time classifying biological organisms. I don't care. That, I don't think that the lion cares how you classify it where you classify it. The platypus doesn't care how you classify it. We like to do this. Okay. And, you know, if I were to draw a circle big enough, that was, let's say called books, then every single one of my books would, would fit within that category because I've drawn a circle that's big enough to do so. But once I narrow my focus onto books that only have to say, or uh, have to, let's say, uh, deal with young earth creation, well, now not every single book is going to fit within that circle or group. Although all of my books that are Young Earth Creation books would fit into the group, Young Earth Creation and books in general, they would not be grouped within my theology books or books dealing specifically with, you know, one category of, let's say, theology, the Trinity. Or what about, you know, my nursing books from my college days. All of these subcategories of books will still fit in the greater book category, but each will have their own subcategory, groups within groups. And this is what we see here. Let's make a circle big enough and title it Things That Breathe. Oh, wow. So now we're going to have, you know, babies and bats and uh, gorillas and uh, uh, lions, horses, all within, all within that circle. Doesn't prove relationship. Things affected by gravity. Well, it turns out whales and bowling balls are affected by gravity. You know, these evolutionists these days, and unfortunately, some of the theistic evolutionists are also adopting such weak arguments. They'll say, oh, well, you know, whales and pine trees are both eukaryotes. And so, you know, they're both related. But that doesn't prove relationship. Okay. Being able to classify things based on traits, characteristics, similarities. Again, here we go. Here's a circle. Things affected by gravity. A chair a human being, uh, you know, bowling ball. Sorry, it's not going to work. Motorized transportation, being able to go from one place to another using a vehicle. We got motorcycles, planes, trucks, boats. You know, we can fit a whole lot into, uh, into that circle. Again, it doesn't prove relationship. So yes, we do see a pattern in life. We can categorize uh, animals and creatures. We see these groups within groups patterns. We share more with the great apes and primates and mammals than we do with fish and bacteria. We share more with the chimpanzee in terms of morphology, physiology, genetics, and anatomy than we do with, with the dog. 
I mean, by definition, we'd have to be more similar to some creatures than others, right? That just makes sense. We're going to be more similar to some like chimpanzees than we are to others like dogs. But this is where uh, pretty soon I'm going to get into the major differences, not just the similarities that the evolutionary community uh, really, unfortunately for them, can't deal with. So again, on to the classification uh, argument from the evolutionary model. Okay, Our species produce milk and we can be classified as mammals. And so can whales and chimpanzees. Again, this doesn't prove relationship any more than the fact that my books on young earth creation, theology, soteriology can be grouped together in a greater group of books called books on Christianity. The existence of a pattern does not tell us what caused the pattern. The question is, what caused the pattern that we observed? Is it nested hierarchies by design or nested hierarchies by descent? And again, DNA function can help answer that question for us. When it comes to classification systematics, we are haplorine primates. So yes, we have a dry nose and so does the chimpanzee and so do monkeys. Again, this doesn't prove anything about relationship. We're also catarine because humans and chimpanzees and other similar creatures have nostrils that are close together and directed downward. And we are also classified as hominoids and hominids. Wow, amazing. There's evolution. You know, you're related to a pine tree. No, this is just man spending a lot of time and energy and, again, money classifying things. The greater question is, what caused that pattern? All right. And I want to point this out. Um, the shared features, and I want to go to a specific slide here. Um, okay. So the shared features we see in the biological world actually allow us to study a creature and then generalize our findings to understand this amazing world we live in. Biology is essentially only possible since the created order is organized hierarchically. It's clear that God created hi hierarchically, okay? Yes, we share more with the chimpanzee than we do with a dog or a fish. This is expected, but this is also a necessary design in order for discovery, in order for discoverability. Biology is design, designed in a way that allows us as humans to study the living world and make some really remarkable discoveries. If the created order, think about this guys, if the created order was not built in nested, in a hierarchical nature, let's say, and nested hierarchies, then innovations in biology may not be as straightforward. Medicine may not be where it is today. There are many good reasons why God created hierarchically. Creating in hierarchical patterns is consistent with God's what? Hierarchical nature. So nested hierarchy, uh, hierarchical patterns, these groups within groups patterns that evolutionists look to as evidence for common descent? No. No, see, here's the thing. There's a lot of what's called um, non-discriminatory lines of evidence. There's a lot of overlap in the creation versus evolution world and models. What that means is we have agnostic lines of evidence, lines of evidence and observations that both models can, can explain, right? Take homology, for example. Homology, the evolutionist is going to say these homologous patterns are due to shared ancestry, common ancestry. While the creationist would say, no, these similar structures are testimony to a common designer. Just like we see with this nested hierarchies, man builds in hierarchical patterns, not on purpose, not to prove the creation model. No, it's, it's natural. It's a natural result of design. We have sedans sharing more with what? SUVs than sedans and SUVs would both share with, uh, you know, tractor trailers. Okay, and sedans and SUVs and tractor trailers are all going to, it can be grouped together. They share more than they do with, you know, an, an unpowered vehicle like a bicycle. And yet your powered vehicles and your unpowered vehicles can all be categorized in a greater group called vehicles. Ways to get you from one place to another. Then you can even bring in a skateboard. This isn't evidence for evolution. These are agnostic lines of evidence. It would be like me saying, you know what, evolutionists, creation is true because the sky is blue or because the earth is round. Sorry, flat earthers. <laughs> but then the evolutionists would say, no, 
that is non-discriminatory evidence because the evolutionary model can also explain why the sky is blue and the earth is round. That's not going to help answer uh, this question of ancestry. And that's how it goes with homology, with nested hierarchies. The biblical creation model, we would actually say, okay, so the Bible, you know, it claims to be the history book of the universe. And um, the Bible tells us that we're created in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. And therefore, there must be something about us that reflects the divine. The, the divine. So maybe we can get a sense for how God designed based on the way we design things. And it just so turns out that we design in nested hierarchical patterns. We design in homologous patterns. We actually design what seems to be interesting transitional forms. But before I get to that, what I want to say is there is an elegant and sophisticated reason for why God created hierarchically, okay? The way God designed the biological world permits for discoverability. And I think that's one of the most important points to consider here. All right. So transitional fossils, these parallels between design and biology extend even further. In our discussion of the deeper fossil layers, we observed the presence of fossils that seem to blend the features of two different categories of creatures. Well, it so turns out that some products of human design also seem to span two categories. So here we go. I want you guys to pay close attention to this. This is fascinating. We're just catching up to the design that God had already thought of in the biological world. God is just way ahead of us in our uh, you know, finite understanding and, and abilities here. But we are even building. And again, if we're made in the image of God, we should be able to get a sense for how God designed based on the way we design. And it just so turns out, and the evolutionists can't deal with it, that we design interesting vehicles that seem to span different modes of transportation like your crossover vehicles. I mean, your Dodge Journey, your Ford Flex, is that a van or an SUV? I don't know. It's right in between. It's its own vehicle. It's its own design modes of transportation. My parents have a Jeep Gladiator, you know, and when they first pulled up in it, beautiful, beautiful uh, Jeep or truck, you know, I said, Wait, is that a Jeep or a truck? No, that's the way it's designed. It's right in the middle. Okay. And it's designed that way for functional purposes. Actually, the military, they've been designing this way for, for a while. Okay. Uh, this is an, an, amphibious, a military amphibious assault vehicle. Now this alone on land wouldn't be the greatest or alone in the, in the ocean wouldn't be the greatest, but it's designed perfectly for that tr uh, transition between sea and land. You have boats, military ships that are built just for the ocean. And then you have military, uh, you know, tanks that are built just for land. But these are actually built for that crossover environment from sea to land. This is the way we're designing. And so, you know, these evolutionists, they want to take, you know, a unicycle, a bicycle, and a four-wheeler and say, you know what, I'm going to predict based on what we see here in terms of the unicycle, bicycle, and four-wheeler, there probably exists you know, a tricycle out there, something with three wheels. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we find. And they line it up. You know, they can line all sorts of, of uh, domestic dog skulls up. And, and make all types of uh, stories in terms of evolutionary series and transitions. Now, th this just proves that you can line things up, okay? Um, and let me see here. And this is why they, they point to, you know, their, their so-called best examples of transitional forms, Tiktaalik, you know, the famous fishapod, um, you know, Archaeopteryx. Again, interesting mosaics is uh, perfectly expected in the creation model. Again, as you can see here, a ship for the ocean, tank for the land. What do we have right in between, according to the evolutionary model, is your perfect transitional form. And then they're going to say, well, you know, modes of transportation, they don't reproduce. Cars don't reproduce. It's like, you know what, we, we should have a debate. Creationists versus evolutionists. Do cars reproduce? Yeah, we understand that. Okay, that's not new to us. They're misunderstanding the model. For one, adding reproduction adds complexity and adds more problems for the evolutionary model. So one day when we're able to design vehicles that can just reproduce and then you don't need all these workers on the line. No, you actually have this car that just you make one and then it just keeps uh, replicating itself. 
apparently to the evolutionist that's that's uh you know weaker design inferior design oh that adds complexity we're not there yet as human beings but the point is and our model suggests that we are looking to get a sense for how god created based on the way we design things that's why when we look to man-made designs we find these in interesting mosaics we find that man uh builds and engineers in hierarchical patterns Okay, we find that human uh, designers build in homologous patterns. This is what we see, and this is expected um, given our model. So with that being said, I want to move into some of the differentiating lines of evidence now, okay? Because non-discriminatory lines of evidence is not necessarily going to help us uh, answer this question of, of ancestry. We want to look to the differentiating line of evidence. I'm just looking at the chat here. Um, yeah, Doki Doki Bible Club says, but change over time. Don't creationists believe in change over exact ever changing genomes requires or ever changing environments requires ever changing genomes. But the types of changes we see, that's what see, here's the thing. We need to look under the hood. But these evolutionists, what they want to do is look to you know the, the um physical changes, they want to look to the phenotype and say, look at this, you know, the sickle cell anemia results in a resistance to malaria. But wait a minute, let's look at the genotype. Let's actually look under the hood. Let's see what's happening. And it turns out that sickle cell anemia is due to what? A broken gene, a broken protein, a deformed hemoglobin protein. It's functionally compromising to the, or to, to the organism with that trait. It's, delet it's reductive. So firstly, their best beneficial mutations that result oftentimes in adaptive episodes on the genotypic level, guess what? They're reductive, they're degrading, they're functionally compromising to the organism. That is not going to counterbalance the damage done in the biological world due to the massive influx of low impact, nearly neutral deleterious mutation accumulation. They need to provide us not with beneficial mutations. Firstly, beneficial mutations are rare. They're about one in a million. We've discovered this through the Lenski experiment. Okay, they're about one in a million. And when they do happen, they're usually due to epigenetic modifications, the pre-existing capacity for that change, or they're reductive. They're due to, you know, uh, the breaking down of a pre-existing system. Or, um, you know, due to, like, for example, bacteria. They'll oftentimes, Lenski's bacteria. They're adapting to their artificial environment by losing genes. <laughs> so they're losing genes for short-term adaptive purposes, but it's actually long-term degeneration because his E. coli bacteria have actually shrunk in overall genome size. This is reductive. What you see in these so-called examples of beneficial mutations is a local increase in fitness, but a universal decrease in total functionality or, or absolute fitness. No, this isn't gonna counterbalance the damage, okay? So uh, great question, Doki. Trying to see if I if there's any other questions that came in. Um, I'm kind of on a roll here. So I'm just going to keep going. And if I see questions come in in the chat, I'll try and multitask and get to those. But I really do just want to get through as much of this as possible. And yeah, again, let me know if, uh, firstly, let me know if it's still first uh, full screen. And then um, let's see. Okay, so here we go. Now, what's interesting is even in the similar genetic sequences, let's say between humans and chimpanzees, what we actually find are significant differences. Even in the similar sequences, we find differences. And we find differences in uh, gene expression, in um, regulatory DNA elements, in alternative splicing, epigenetics. The 3D genome. And I'm going to go over a little bit of that here. Okay, guys, because this is important. And the evolutionists, I've looked to their rescue device. It's always just so stories. No real examples of showing how these differences can, can accumulate and come about. So here we go. Studies show that gene expression in humans is significantly different from the expression found in chimpanzees, especially in the brain, where one study showed that 90% of the human genes were turned on at significantly higher levels than chimpanzee genes. Another study showed the brain DNA sequences of both species didn't match 
evolutionary descent predictions for a common ancestor. It's like these orphan genes. We have these taxonomically restricted genes that are exactly what we would expect based on common design, right? Where God creates these distinct archetypes and front loads them with heterozygosity where you have some DNA elements unique to those specific creatures. And that was, that's what we find. These orphan genes that have no evidence for any uh, ans ancestry. They're just there. They pop up. And the evolutionists oftentimes resort to a circular argument, what's called de novo gene synthesis, which basically says that a non-coding area of the genome becomes, uh, you know, functional and uh, you get the evolution of an orphan gene, but it, you know, it's, or, or gene duplication, where you have a, you know, a duplicated region of, of the genome followed by what's called neo-functionalization and, you know, a series of mutate. Unfortunately, there's a waiting time problem for, for them there because you get a duplicated gene. That's, that's just a waste. It's, it's there. It's wasteful of energy and resources for the cell. So basically natural selection is going to remove that before it can even uh, evolve through a series of, of deleterious mutations, something that that's novel and functional. So, you know, that's just a story, but, Nonetheless, it's circular because you ask them, you know, how do you explain orphan genes? How do those come about? And the evolution says, well, de novo gene synthesis. And then you see, and then you ask, you know, what's de novo gene synthesis and why de novo gene synthesis? And then they say, well, because orphan genes exist. They're going in a circle because they can never conclude a designer. Okay, so here's some papers. Uh, and I cover this in great detail in my new special creation book. Uh, notice this. From this paper titled Elevated Gene Expression Levels Distinguish uh, Human from Non-Human Primate Brains. So this is from the secular technical literature. This isn't Creatius making this stuff up. We identified 169 genes that exhibited expression differences between human and chimpanzee's cortex. And 91 were ascribed to the human lineage by using uh, macaques as, as an outgroup. Our results indicate that the human brain displays a distinctive pattern. Notice a distinctive pattern of gene expression relative to non-human primates with higher expression levels for many genes belonging to a wide variety of uh, functional classes. So we have many ways uh, to differentiate between uh, the universal and separate ancestry model. This is what the separate ancestry model would would suggest. Notice this, another paper, intra and interspecific variation in primate gene expression pattern. We identified species specific gene expression patterns indicating that changes in protein and gene expression have been particularly pronounced, uh, pronounced in the human brain, which makes sense, right? We may share a lot in terms of anatomy and morphology with the chimpanzee, but guess what? Is the chimpanzee giving presentations over StreamYard, building PowerPoints, are they, are they, uh, you know, making cars? Did they design the space shuttle? Are they uh, writing and reading books? Of course not. Of course not. There's some massive differences there. Okay, and again, we're seeing massive differences uh, reflected in the genotype. Alternative splicing differences. A paper analyzing alternative splicing differences between humans and chimpanzees reads: Alternative splicing is a powerful mechanism affording extensive proteomic and regulatory diversity from a limited repertoire of genes. Surprisingly, six to 8% of profiled orthologous exons display pronounced splicing level differences in the corresponding tissues from the two species. In total, so here's a paper um, titled uh, Predominant Patterns of Splicing Evolution on Human Chimpanzee uh, and, and Macaque evolutionary images. In total, 15, 1,526 exons and exon sets, sets from 1,236 genes show significant splice. So significant splicing differences. These aren't just minute differences among primates. More than 60% of these differences represent a constitutive to alternative exon transitions, while an additional 25% represent changes in exon inclusive frequency. Epigenetic differences. We have this extra layer of complicated, of sophisticated information. We have just millions of genetic switches just waiting to be turned on or off the environment for adaptive change, adaptive episodes. Okay, because we need some kind of control mechanism. 
And if every single gene were turned on at the same time, that would be bad, that would be harmful, that would lead to disease. And so we have these control mechanisms. We have the epigenome, which is above and beyond the genetic code, basically, that controls when and where and how certain genes are expressed and turned on and turned off. Um, so just looking at the chat here, see if anything, um, I <laughs> appreciate that cram. I think you are killing this. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Yeah. Typically I just put a bunch of slides together out of my thousands, uh, slide, uh, slide filled slideshows and just kind of see where it goes. I mean, there's so much evidence against evolution for creation that, um, you know, this could be a, a 15 hour presentation. We'd still be uh, just getting started. So even in the epigenome, we find massive differences. Genetic tags that make chemical changes to genes are known as epigenetic mechanisms. <clears throat> epigenetic tags regulate uh, DNA sequences. Studies show that epigenetic differences in human and chimpanzee brain genes are far too great to indicate an evolutionary connection, but rather reflect the creature to kind distinctiveness creationists would predict. Notice this, a study on comparative uh, epigenetics showed orangutans and gorillas had more similar patterns to humans than chimpanzees. I mean, we find we're going to see that with the Y chromosome. So I'm not going to spoil anything. I'll, I'll wait for that. Don't want to get too ahead of myself just yet. A result completely backward to evolutionary predictions. Guys, paper after paper, I, you know, I highly recommend the special creation book updated and expanded should be available tomorrow. I'm hoping we sent it in for publishing 300 pages. We go in, I go into all of this in great detail. Okay, so here's a couple more papers. This isn't creation, making this stuff up. We also found extensive species level divergence in patterns of DNA methylation and that hundreds of genes exhibit significantly lower levels of promoter methylation in the human brain than in what? Chimpanzee brain, our closest cousin. All of these changes in gene expression, gene regulation, the epigenome, alternative splicing, the 3D genome, architecture, Y chromosome, they all had to have come about independently since the split six to 10 million years ago. Even according to the evolutionary time frame, they don't have enough time to account for these massive differences. Major differences between humans and chimpanzees. See, they want to focus on the similarities, but they never want to talk about the differences because they know that many of these differences are unexplainable from evolutionary mechanisms. The chimp genome is 10 to 12% larger than the human genome and is not in a near finished state like the human genome. It is considered a rough draft. When large regions of the two genomes are compared, uh, critical sequence dissimilarities become evident. Extremely large blocks of dissimilarity exist on a number of key chromosomes, including marked structural differences between the entire male Y chromosomes. We're going to get on that. Uh, we're going to get into that in great detail. Distinct differences in gene function and regulation are now known to be a more significant factor in determining differences in traits between organisms than the gene sequence alone. Research in this area has clearly demonstrated that this is the case with humans and apes, where marked dissimilarities in expression patterns are evident. The 3D genome, huge differences. Here's a paper right here. Uh, is, um, three, is 3D genome topology conserved? Given the incredible variability among genome configurations within a single type of creature, let alone that which exists between creatures, human versus chimpanzee, this area of evolutionary comparison has been difficult for secular researchers. Notice this. Now a new study published in Trends in Genetics evaluates research in this emerging field that shows the, pay attention, human 3D genome is distinctly unique to humans confirming previous research that showed is it is as different compared to chimp as it is to a mouse. And apparently the chimpanzee is our closest cousin. Okay. So this is where I really, really, really want to, um, hammer home just how, uh, just how fatal these arguments are to evolutionary theory. So we spend a lot of time on the uni parentally inherited in DNA compartments, like the Y chromosome. Okay. So we get, we inherit the Y chromosome from our, from our fathers and um, we inherit uh, the mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. And it just so turns out that some of the best evidence for a literal Adam and Eve comes from genetics, comes from our genome. We've literally discovered, 
you know, Y chromosome Noah and mitochondrial Eve in our genome. We can take a mitochondrial DNA worldwide, which is incredibly low in terms of variation. Y every single male Y chromosome is nearly identical. Nearly identical. There's only one male Y chromosome, and it goes back to a single ancestor just 4,500 years ago based on the fast mutation rate, both three per generation, low variation. And we're all about 99.999% the same as humans. But yet it turns out that when you consider overall architecture, gene content, and size differences between the human and chimpanzee Y chromosome, our Y chromosomes are only about 35% the same. Now, when you don't consider size differences, then it's about 70% the same, but still way too different to account for, especially considering that every single human male Y chromosome is the same. But yet, supposedly, we share a common ancestor with the chimpanzee. Chimpanzee is our closest cousin, the chimpanzee and the bonobo, but yet it's only about 35% the same. And then they'll want to invoke, um, you know, well, the Y chromosome mutates faster. Yes. The fact that the Y chromosome mutates fast is amazing evidence for separate ancestry because guess what? Every, again, every single male Y chromosome is nearly identical, low variation, but yet the Y chromosome mutates fast. So firstly, why don't we find any highly divergent people groups in the Y chromosome on the planet? We don't. The Y chromosome is incredibly uniform population-wide but yet the uh, Y chromosome mutates fast. A mutation adds diversity because a mutation is adding something that was not previously there. So the Y chromosome in the human population should be more diverse, but yet it's not. It's incredibly uniform, low variation. So the only way to explain a Y chromosome with incredibly low variation, but also mutates fast is through the young earth creation model and the fact that the Y chromosome is not old. It only goes back 4,500 years, so that makes sense. But we also have evidence for the Tower of Babel dispersal because we have what's called geographically specific Y chromosomes. African Y chromosomes, Asian Y chromosomes, European Y chromosomes, because after the Tower of Babel, you have different people groups migrating to different places in the world, and they independently accumulate new mutations. And we can see this. We can see this in allele frequencies, and, you know, a lot of evolution. So say, okay, design diversity, it's post hoc, ad hoc. How can you tell the difference between, you know, a created allele and an allele due to mutation? Well, it's easy. Okay. If it's common and functional and not disease causing, then it's function, then it's created. If it's rare, if it's, if it's in low frequency, like blue eyes only exists in, in a, you know, a subpopulation, small part of the human population, then it's the result of, of a uh, mutation. So it's very easy to figure that out, which is why we, when it comes to the mitochondrial Eve consensus sequence, we actually have a consensus sequence, which is um, pretty amazing. So again, the, the mitochondrial DNA, incredibly low uh, variation. On average, you're only looking at 20 to 30 DNA differences in the mitochondrial DNA compartment between any two people worldwide. And yet the mitochondrial DNA mutates fast as well. So these uniparentally inherited DNA compartments are, uh, provide us some of the most amazing evidence, irrefutable evidence for separate ancestry. So that brings us to the Y chromosome dissimilarity between humans and chimpanzees. Thank you very much, who, what, when, for the uh, support. Notice this. This is not a creationist paper. This is a secular paper. One of my favorites came out in 2010. Chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes are remarkably divergent in structure and gene content. The chimpanzee MSY harbors twice as many massive palindromes as the human MSY, yet it has lost large fractions of the MSY protein coding genes and gene families present in the last common ancestor. Notice this. There's no homology or alignable counterpart in massive portions of the human and chimpanzee Y chromosome. I mean, this is... Look at their conclusion. We conclude that since the separation of the chimpanzee and human lineages, sequence gain and loss have been far more concentrated in the MSY than in the balance of the genome. What are the differences? There are two main classes of MSY sequences shared between two species. Okay, so you have these two regions 
And uh, the ex-degenerate regions of chimp and man differ by a full 10%. This is huge considering the 99% identical claim that we have heard parroted so often over the previous several decades. But this is only the beginning of the differences. Notice this, when you compare these specific regions, they had to appeal to what? Extensive rearrangement and rampant sequence gain and loss. Because, you know, they can't question the bigger picture. They can question details of the evolutionary model. But remember, it's assume evolution to prove evolution. So they are desperately trying to account for these massive differences. Well, maybe you had a huge loss here, huge gain here, duplication here, you know, whatever it is that, that they invoke when it comes to these differences and not just the Y chromosome. Um, 30% of the entire MSY has no counterpart in the human MSY and vice versa. These are sizable differences. Guys, again, when you consider overall architecture, gene content, and size differences, it's only 35% the same between humans and chimpanzees. That's it. That's enough to falsify evolution. And um, it turns out that the human and gorilla Y chromosomes are more similar than the human and the chimpanzee Y chromosome. There's a break in their nested hierarchy. Orphan genes, there's no consistent hierarchy there. Convergent evolution. Anytime convergent evolution is invoked, it is an admittance into the lack of uniqueness in the universal phylogenetic tree of life. Okay. Orphan genes, the Y chromosome dissimilarity. Uh, incomplete lineage sorting, where depending on what, what genes you look at, you get totally different trees. It's pick and choose with the uh, evolutionists. Notice this. The amount of difference in the Y chromosome between humans and chimpanzees was a huge surprise, not predicted, and was a difference expected between human and chicken autosomes, autosomal DNA. The 30% difference among human and chimp MSY regions was a shock. This amount of difference was expected between the autosomes of human and something like a chicken to use their example in the paper. And chicken is not even a mammal. I mean, even according to the evolutionary model, when did humans and uh, you know chickens share a common ancestor? Finding this much difference in one of the sex chromosomes was huge. When they looked at the gene content of the two respective chromosomes, they were additionally surprised to find that there were many fewer genes in chimp and many more genes in man, with only two thirds as many distinct genes or gene families as the human MSY and only half as many protein coding transcription units. That is, they found huge differences in the number and type of genes on the two Y chromosomes and were forced to claim massive gene loss or gain as the evolutionary mechanism responsible. Of course, design, remember, they don't question the bigger picture. Design was not even considered as a possible answer. So you got these militant critics. I've put out a challenge. You know, they want to say, we got a heat problem. I say, you got a genetics problem. And genetics is the best way to determine ancestry. It's empirical. It's direct observation. That's why we can see in real time through pedigree-based studies, we can see how much or how little the DNA changes from generation to generation. And we know that it's fast. And even considering things like purifying selection, guess what? When you've only got a few DNA differences separating any two people in the Y chromosome and the uh, mitochondrial DNA in the Y chromosome, it's only a few hundred. Um, in the mitochondrial DNA max, it's only about 100 or 120. And with, with a, a fast mutating DNA compartment and low variation, you've only got a couple hundred generations max of change. You can't take those DNA compartments back 200 to 300,000 years. No, no, no. That's why when it comes to uh, uh, genetic diversity in humans, we have low genetic diversity overall. That's expected based on our model. 6,000 years ago, God creates two people, Adam and Eve. Automatically, that restricts genetic diversity. And that's what we see today. The evolutionary model, on the other hand, they expected high levels of genetic diversity since they want to put humans back a couple hundred thousand years. And before that, you've got Erectus. Before that, you got Habilis. Before that, you got Australopithecine-like ancestors. That's a lot of diversity accumulating. So, as always, instead of tapping out, they invoked what's called the out-of-Africa population bottleneck, which would have been a near-extinction event. It would have driven that population into extinction, okay? Because it wasn't just a one-generation population bottleneck. 
It was a multi-generational bottleneck. And they did that to reduce levels of genetic diversity because the observed empirical data was not consistent with their model. So your militant evolutionists like your uh, Gutsy Gibbons out there, you know, they'll say or the paper says, you know, maybe we're looking at, uh, you know, sperm competition or polygamous relationships in chimpanzees or faster rates of gene conversion. Whatever it is, they've gone untested. These are just fancy stories, nothing more than uninformative gloss. These are hypotheses that have been untested. They're unrealistic. So again, don't just give me a story. Don't just give me a rescue device. I want you to apply mathematical models to try to demonstrate how a sequence can change extremely rapidly, including wholesale rearrangement of significant parts and the evolution of entire gene families <laughs> in a relatively short amount of time, yet stay homogeneous. Remember, I pointed out that every single male Y chromosome is, is nearly identical, nearly the same. 44 uh, slot, thank you so much for... Um, for the super chat. Um, appreciate the, the support. Uh, so here's a question. What, who, when I have a question for you, Donnie, why are these brave internet atheists evolution like Aaron Ross so afraid to debate you? <laughs> Good question. We've had a 2022 evolution debate challenge series and, uh, Aaron Ross specifically has not taken it up. Uh, we have, we have had about 40 of them. Um, and Aaron Ross is what's called the phylogeny challenge which is being demolished here. This is all evidence for separate ancestry, but you know, Aaron Ra won't have any idea how to address these arguments. Very out of date, which is exactly why he um, he won't debate. That's why he has people like, you know, uh, Dodgeball, Dan Stern, Cardinal on his channal to address the uh, arguments from mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome. And then uh, Dr. Dan Stern, Cardinal, who's apparently their expert, fails to address our arguments. So if Dan can't address them, then Aaron Ra definitely uh, won't be able to address them. So uh, that's a very good question, uh, brother. So I was just looking through the chat and looks like I'm all updated. Uh, appreciate that Doki Doki Bible Club. Uh, I am going longer than I thought. So if you did send me a list of questions, I may save them for a future show because I'm starting to get winded here. <laughs> we got another uh, four or five hour show tomorrow. So let me see, we started here 1030. So I'm already over the hour and a half. Mark, I'll start winding it down here with a couple more points. Okay. Cause I want to leave no stone unturned. We've addressed homology, transitional forms, nested hierarchies. We've uh, addressed their whole, uh, you know, obsession with classifying animals. <laughs> <laughs> we've addressed uh, their argument that says, well, evolution just means change over time. And since organisms change, then whales and pine trees are related. Like, sorry, no, the type of change we observe is not the type of change that's necessary to take a fish to fishermen, to take a bacteria-like organism into a biologist. You still have not presented me with a type of selection that can remove so many low impact mutations that are pouring in generation after generation. Guys, we are all multiply mutant. Okay. There's seven to 8 billion people on the planet for sake of argument through selection, just remove 50% of the worst mutants on the planet. Unrealistic amounts of selection. Well, guess what? You're still left with 50%, about four to 5 billion people that are more mutant than the generation before it. Because the point of genetic degeneration and genetic entropy is that the, each generation is more and more mutant because we're accumulating more and more mutations. Now, selection can see the biggest ones and remove the biggest ones. And selection may even be able to amplify your best beneficial mutations, even though the best beneficial mutations are reductive. And so they are not going to counterbalance the damage. And you got people like Dan that says, oh, you know, proponents of genetic entropy, they don't uh, account for things like, you know, fitness variation or selection. It's like, yes, there's been thousands of numerical simulations done considering fitness variation, synergistic epistasis, mutation count mechanism, truncation selection. They've all been falsified. They've all been falsified. And all the critics can do is repeat already debunked talking points. They've even considered junk DNA. Let's just assume for sake of argument, even, even though it's, it's not defendable, defensible, let's just say the whole genome's junk, mostly. And given the known mutation rate, 10 harmful mutations accumulating each generation is still too much. Okay, evolution is dead. Chromosome 2 fusion. It was uh, Ken, I think Ken Miller who said if there was no fusion, 
then you know there was no evolution. Well, sorry to break it to you, there was no uh, fusion. You don't get highly functional genes by slamming together two chromosomes because it turns out that the so-called fusion site actually recommend, um, represents a promoter, an active promoter for a functional gene that overlaps it, known as the DDX11L2 gene. And the so-called telomeric-like repeats, right, where there should be way more, like 10,000 if there really was a fusion event, represents functional DNA elements that are found all throughout the genome in all chromosomes. They have nothing to do with a fusion event and their functional and gene expression. And they've never discovered a second centromere. And where they try and say is a second centromere, that's also overlapped by a functional gene. I mean, the chromosome 2 fusion is just a joke. Okay, they weren't expecting, they, they didn't predict this at first. They found out the discrepancy that, you know, chimpanzees and other uh, non-human apes, because that's what they want to say taxonomically, that, you know, we're human apes and chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas and orangutans, they're non-human apes. Well, you know what? You may be an ape, but I'm not an ape because the genetic data here is demonstrating sufficiently that we're not related to what you want to say are non-human apes, okay? Sorry, guts a given. But uh, that being said, they didn't predict before this discrepancy came about that we have 46 chromosomes and uh, apes have 48. So they found the discrepancy and they tried to explain it away with an end-to-end -end fusion of two small chromosomes called 2A and 2B in an ape-like ancestor humans shared with chimpanzees. It's also claimed that a fusion-like signature of this event, along with an extra fossil centromere, is present on human chromosome 2 as proof. However, both the alleged fusion and centromere sites fail the test when analyzed closely. Not only are these alleged evolutionary signatures very small in size and degenerate, but both of them are found inside functional genes. The alleged fusion site functions as a genetic switch called a promoter, just as I said, inside a long non-coding RNA gene. And the so-called fossil centromere contains both coding and non-coding sequence inside a large protein coding gene. Combined together, these data destroy the evolutionary hypothesis of a fusion. Notice this, because the evolutionists will say, oh, the, the DDX11L2 gene, that's not functional. What are you talking, at best you have low level transcription. Oh, really? Oh, conspiracy cats tried to say this in my debate with them. So I pointed this out. One, it is an active promoter for the transcription of an alternative transcript. It binds at least 12 transcription factors. It initiates RNA transcription. No, it's just low level transcription, not really functional. Oh, you sure about that? It initiates RNA transcription, which begins within its own sequence. It has chromat a chromatin profile that further supports its active promoter status. Tompkins also provides evidence that the DDX11L2 gene produces RNA that helps regulate the DDX11L gene family, just as has been shown with other functional pseudogenes. It's been overturned, guys. Notice this. This is not even a creationist paper right here. The evolution of African great ape subtelomeric heterochromatin, it's a mouthful, and the uh, fusion of homo, uh, human chromosome 2. Notice this. Where we should find this specific type of satellite DNA around the human chromosome too, we don't find it, okay? Around the reputed fusion site, we don't find what should be there. And the secular scientists admit this and their hypotheses like, well, it's been lost over time. Cool story, bro. I want empirical science. I don't want your pseudoscience. I want testable predictions. That is the gold standard of science. And that is exactly why arguments like the chromosome two fusion have been overturned because the so-called fusion site represents an active promoter inside a highly essential and functional gene, the DDX 11 L2 gene. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not a fusion. Chimpanzee and gorilla chromosomes differ from human chromosomes by the presence of large blocks of subterminal heterochromatin thought to be composed primarily of arrays of tandem satellite sequence. That's it. Here's some further reading if you want to dig deep. You know, some of these guys, they've tried to put forth some rescue devices. There's a paper here called Debunking the Debunkers, where a PhD geneticist, Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, he um, absolutely just demolishes um, the critics. Okay, but again, we have the Ventura paper here that's not even a creationist source that just ends this question. These differences in chromosomes between humans and chimpanzee and gorillas, 
okay, the, these large blocks of uh, DNA, they're, they're not there when they should be. They're, and then, you know, your evolutionists like Eric, I want to say, well, you know, the telomeric-like sequences that are there at the reputed fusion site, you know, they're there more than anywhere else in the genome. Who cares? It just, I don't care if there's more there at that site than anywhere else. That's probably why they chose that site because they need they needed a site with you know some kind of anomaly to to you know be able to brainwash so many into believing that there is a fusion. Okay, it's highly degenerate, and what is there, even if it is more than anywhere else in the genome, represents functional DNA elements that contribute to the function and health of the organism, contribute to the overlapping gene, the DDX eleven L two gene. With, with your promoter, and uh, they function in gene expression. And they're found all throughout the genome, yes. They have nothing to do with fusions elsewhere in the genome. They're there in, in varying degrees of numbers, okay? And they act in gene expression, among other things. So there's more there at that location. It doesn't matter. It do that's probably, <laughs> lastly, and again, that's probably why they chose that location. They needed something. You know, remember that... <laughs> There always has to be a little bit of, in order to even be able to uh, push that, you know, there's got to be something they could look to. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Here, uh, pedigree based mutation rates. Um, I was talking about this earlier estimates of the mutation rate with a non phylogenetic approach. Remember, they calibrate the data, it's circular. They want to assume the geologic column, they want to assume the human chimpanzee split and say, well, you know, the mutation rate's really slow, actually, because humans and chimpanzees split from a common ancestor six to 10 million years ago. And so when we compare the differences, but as a matter of fact, when you look at these phylogenetic trees, you actually see differing size branches. Okay, and I've done whole shows on this, showing that, uh, you know, people are picking up more mutations in the same amount of time than their cousins. Differing size branches, differing uh, mutation rates. Now, mutation rates are basically fast, but they're not constant, but you could say they're constantly fast, which is a major problem for the evolutionary theory. Notice this, tenfold higher than phylogenetically derived rates. Okay, so, you know, there, there's just so many um, false assumptions that the evolutionists want to make when it comes to arguing against the, the creation model. Okay, here's uh, the last portion. Of, of the show here when it comes to endogenous retroviruses. Now, I've done whole shows on this, as everybody knows. <clears throat> I recently did almost three-hour lecture on this a little while ago. Um, and just looking at the chat. Okay, well, I appreciate all the support. We still got 70 people here, even after um, coming close to two hours. So, you know, I guys, I told you this conference would be would be uh, comprehensive, technical. You know, we wanted to give the fatal blow to evolutionary theory. We wanted to deal with all of their favorite talking points, whether it be junk DNA, nested hierarchies, endogenous retroviruses, their precious chromosome two fusion, which I rarely see the evolutionary community even trying to defend anymore especially in debate, you know, they've, they've never heard of half of what is being talked about in this, uh, in this conference. Okay. So ERVs, according to the standard evolutionary story of endogenous retrovirus, an ERV is a stretch of DNA found in your DNA that got there when one of your ancestors was infected by a virus. So basically the question is, and I'm just going to explain this in a nutshell since I've already got hours and hours worth of shows and a 200 page book on this. Okay. So the question is, are these really, you know, the ancient remnants of, of past viral infections or are they uh, created units of DNA function? Okay. Some evolutionists refer to herb sequences as fossil viruses, um, scars basically that give them a historical record of uh, evolutionary history. Okay. So here's some important points. Retroviruses can reverse the flow of genetic information. That's reverse transcription. Retroviruses have an RNA genome that can be copied into DNA. Um, when it comes to the, the story of endogenous retroviruses, you have exogenous retroviruses, okay, like HIV. They would uh, essentially infect, but they'd have to infect a germ cell, okay? And that way it can be passed on to offspring. The provirus has to enter the germline. And then from this point, 
uh, the endogenous retrovirus can spread throughout the population. If the endogenous retroviruses are passed on long enough, mutations can deactivate the virus, meaning active proviruses will cease to be produced. An individual may be producing active viruses, but with time and mutations, this is the evolutionary story, of course, these proviruses become mutated and eventually no longer produce infectious proviruses, but the viral sequences are still passed on to offspring. This is where fixation can happen, okay, which means a certain population will all have them. But here's the problem. What we actually find is that without these retroviruses, retroviral-like elements, we would not have placentas. We would not exist. We would not be bearing live young. Okay, herbs are expressed during human embryonic development. So let's answer some of these questions. Well, the reason why we share herb sequences is for a number of functional reasons, determining cell types, regulating genes, embryological development. They actually, so the, the way these herbs are built, all right, they have your LTRs, which stand for long terminal repeats on, on both ends. You have your gag, pull, and uh, ENV components of it. But it turns out that all of these properties, the reason why they look so similar to exogenous retroviruses is because two of their jobs, one of them is, is tumor suppression, where they uh, carry out this job through viral mimicry. Therefore, they wouldn't be able to carry out this job if they didn't have similarities to exogenous retroviruses. They also fight off uh, exogenous retroviral infection. They are our antiviral protectors, put it that way. And they also carry out this job based on their similarities to exogenous retroviruses, okay? But most importantly, guys, is um, in the early stages of development, okay, they act in embryological development. Now, we know that humans will develop what is called a placenta. And a placenta is a temporary organ that forms during pregnancy, this structure is absolutely essential. It is crucial for normal and healthy pregnancy. It provides nutrition to the developing baby and it also helps to get rid of waste. And I talked about this specific function uh, quite extensively in my debate with, um, in my debate with Luca Medugno. Now for the placenta to work, this important structure needs to be connected to the baby. And it turns out, pay attention, guys, an endogenous retrovirus is key to embryological development and placental function. The placenta secretes a protein that binds it to the embryo, which keeps the two attached for the next several months of development. The DNA that makes up that protein is very similar to a region of a retrovirus that allows the virus to attach to its host cell. So, so given the nature of this function and given the nature of its functions in fighting off viruses and in tumor suppression, herb sequences require their similarities to exogenous retroviruses in order to carry out their numerous functional roles. Without endogenous retroviruses, the placenta, which is critical to pregnancy and embryological development, would not work we would essentially not exist. These functional DNA elements are essential for life. So I would not be surprised, and I'm not surprised, that all forms of life actually share endogenous retroviral-like sequences. Because, of course, the chimpanzee, the mouse, and the human all require functional DNA elements to assist in embryological development, to assist in determining cell types, to assist in fighting off viral infections. Okay, so it shouldn't be surprising that we actually share them with the biological world. Okay, so endogenous retroviruses don't just assist, though, in embryological development, in embryonic um, immune systems. They also work in our immune system after we are born. And I want to get to a couple um, slides on that. So, I mean, there's just paper after paper going over, uh, you know, junk DNA overturn, which we talked about earlier. Okay. Um, the four-dimensional genome. So right here, switching sides, how endogenous retroviruses protect us from viral infections. This is a secular paper, guys. And look what they say, long disregarded. So they're admitting that they assume that herb sequences were junk. Long disregarded as junk DNA or genomic dark matter. I'm not making this stuff up. Endogenous retroviruses have turned out to represent important components of the antiviral immune response. Not only regulate cellular immune activation, but may even directly target invading viral pathogens. 
One focus will be on recent advances in the role of herbs as regulators of antiviral gene expression. I mean, these are amazing things that are happening on the genomic level. Okay, our immune system pathways are dependent upon enzymes created by endogenous retroviruses and herb like elements. And their counter responses to this, you know, co option with no real empirical evidence. All we have to say to that is cool story, bro. Because PhD virologist Dr. Dodgeball Dan Stern Cardinal literally admitted that no, we've never seen an exogenous retrovirus, in fact, integrate, be passed on, and become functional in the embryo become functional in determining cell types. No, all they have is a cool story. And you know what? It's not even very cool. Okay. It's kind of embarrassing to be uh, completely honest with you. So um, right here, <laughs> herbs appear to play important roles in physiology, fetal development, and human evolution. If the accidental infection, so right, assuming evolution always in these papers, of a mammalian ancestor by an exogenous retrovirus had never occurred, the placenta and the mammals that produce it, including humans, would have never existed. So guys, these so-called ancient remnants of past viral infections are protecting our bodies against microbes and other viruses. They are also involved in allowing for small but significant changes in how the human body works in general. I mean, these herb sequences are doing amazing things. And I could spend the next 20 hours, which is why I wrote a whole book on it, going over their amazing roles in cellular differentiation and regulation of gene expression. Um, I mean, as you can see here, I got a ton of, of papers. Retroviral promoters in the human genome, antiviral immunity. Scientists identify new beneficial function of endogenous retroviruses in, in immune response. Um, transposable elements are a prolific source of tightly regulated biochemically active non-coding elements, such as, uh, transcription factor binding sites and non-coding RNAs. Our results suggest that a subset of TEs are important for gene regulation in early mouse development. Guys, if you snip in the lab, this specific class of retrotransposon in the mouse genome, if you snip it out, Okay, the mouse is developing and then it dies. You know why it dies? Because it's development. The, the mouse, the life of the mouse depends on that retrotransposon. Far from being junk DNA, the pervasive retrotransposons that populate the genome have a powerful capacity. It's not just one or two. It's not just one or two. Okay, they have a powerful capacity to influence, uh, influence genes and chromatin. And I think I'm going to wrap it up there um, because I'm pretty much out of energy here, but I do got to say that this was a ton of fun. Hey, we still got 75 people in the chat. We just hit the two hour mark. So I wanted to contribute what I can here. And I think I touched on all the points that I wanted to. Um, I understand that uh, Doki Doki sent me an email with uh, questions and uh, screenshots of the questions. So that's much appreciated. And um, Okay, it looks like I'll have to download them, which is cool. So what I can do is look at those and uh, do a Q&A maybe after this conference uh, going over uh, these questions, okay? So anyways, guys, it's been another, uh, another busy day of the Defending Genesis Conference. Okay, so far, I think we're up to close to 14 hours of conference content. I've made a playlist currently. Um, please share that around pass this information around. The truth is important. So earlier today, session five, we had Joe Hubbard and John Mackay. And then um, I just noticed that there's a typo in presentation here. So um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, and uh, Donnie B, evolutionist, favorite arguments. Tomorrow we'll be back here for session seven and eight. Dr. Jerry Bergman, Professor David McQueen, and um, George Bond our award-winning co-host. I'll also give you guys an announcement, maybe in a community post. I'll also mention it, of course, tomorrow. The second this book is released, I am going to price it at cost because I want to buy a bunch of them so I can pass them around. And since we sell and get them published through Amazon, that's really the only way we can do it. So for a couple of days, I'll leave it that way. So anybody who uh, wants to get it at cost as well, 
um, please do uh, do so. Um, okay, so let me look at the chat here. And um, um, seeing if there's any questions that I can get to right now. Um, Doki Doki Bible Club. Amen. Appreciate the the support there. Um, so let's see. Zach asks, 1.1 million beneficial plus 7 billion people is still 7,000 beneficial mutations every single generation. So yeah, that's not going to work because again, um, there's been thousands of numerical simulations done. Okay. The, the, Genetic ent the reality of genetic entropy has been verified using uh, computer modeling. And they've actually considered super beneficial mutations, unrealistic amounts of beneficial mutations. And guess what? Even with unrealistic amounts of beneficial mutations, even though most are reductive, genetic degeneration is, is inevitable. So unfortunately, uh, that doesn't work either. Um, you would expect divergence in expression levels, novel genes. So again, most of these so-called beneficial mutations are still degrading, functionally compromising to organisms, okay? Or just random epigenetic changes. So those aren't adding anything novel. Those aren't adding any real complexity. These are changes based on the pre-existing capacity for that change. So to say that we get these differences, these significant differences in gene expression and uh, you know alternative splicing, epigenetics, and just the 3D genome in general, not to mention the Y chromosome through time and beneficial mutations, that has to be demonstrated or else it's just a story, okay? This is storytelling and this is where I respond with, you know, cool story, bro. Uh, what is an orphan gene? Good question, uh, bold as a lion. So an orphan gene is a taxonomically restricted gene that is uh, just restricted to, to certain uh, species. Okay, where there's, it's called an orphan because there's no evidence for its ancestral precursors. So the evolutionists have a problem with that because, um, you know, they don't know where these come from and they have to invoke evolutionary processes to explain them. And those evolutionary processes, they, they don't work. They are, uh, it's circular reasoning, especially de novo gene synthesis. But remember, these taxonomically restricted and essential genes are exactly what we would expect given the uniqueness of each created kind. We would expect certain sets of genes that are, that are only shared within a kind. Okay. So think of you have three books, but within that book, you have certain words that aren't found in all three books. Book one, you have certain words that you're not going to find in book two or three. Book two, you have certain words that you're not going to find in book one or three. Okay. These are unique sequences and um, DNA elements. So the next question was from who, what, when, and um, I got to that one. So I do appreciate that. Um, so, all right. There's a few questions there and <laughs> Zach left the building. George, thanks for the support brother. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're struggling for sure. They're struggling for sure. So, okay, guys, thank you so much for the support. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, that's two hours. I'm going to rest for the night because tomorrow we've got another uh, day of presentations, audience Q&As, and uh, discussion. Guys, standing for truth is out. God bless.